Thanks a lot for uh, coming. I'm actually I'm I'm honored to give this talk at Yahoo because I and the other web guys at Plaxo have learned a lot from Yahoo. And I mean, we all read Steve's stuff. Actually, it was funny uh, when I realized I was giving this talk right before Steve. Uh, I was a little bit nervous because I was like, I mean, I, I I sort of learned what I'm saying from him and from our experiences. And so, you know, how's that going to work out? But it turned out to be a really great uh, compliment. And then obviously, you know, Doug and the, all that stuff has been really influential to us too. So it's really cool to, to be here. Um, so yeah, I haven't changed the formatting from OzCon, but uh, the content is all still fresh. So um, I, I'm using, I guess, JavaScript here as a sort of a catch-all term for client-side, you know, Ajax web performance, but as opposed to all the other important stuff that other people here like Cal Henderson and stuff have talked about on the back end for how you make that fast. Um, so just to say a little bit about me, um, I was the first uh, employee at Plaxo, and so I've done a lot of different things, but I'm, I'm currently the, the chief platform architect and working on how we can sort of open up uh, the social web and how you can stay connected to people even though they're using a zillion different sites. And that's for another talk, but I also um, was the first web developer and sort of became the web architect and ran our, our team there. And so, and we built this uh, rather ambitious online address book and calendar app um, in Plaxo 3.0 that I'll show you a little bit about. Um, which just launched in June, and that's where we learned all the lessons for, for this talk. Um, although I'd like to say that I've been abusing web browsers uh, since the early days, because I, I grew up in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, where NCSA Mosaic was developed. And so it was sort of always fun when you know, new betas would come out. And as the things started to develop, you could figure out what other little tricks you could do to sort of make them do things they weren't always originally intended for. And that, that has continued with Ajax and everything else. Um, and then just to say a quick bit about Plaxo. So if, if you haven't ever seen uh, Plaxo, we're a startup. We've been around for about five years. And we make a smart address book and calendar that help you stay connected to people that you want to stay connected to across all the different tools and services that you use and as they move and change jobs. And so we, we sync into um, Outlook and Mac and Thunderbird and Yahoo and AIM and your mobile phone and a whole bunch of other places. And then we have about 15 million members. And whenever one of them updates their contact info, if you're in their address book, you'll get their update automatically. And so you can just sort of, whenever you use any of your tools, you just sort of always know that the information is always current. And then the sort of the center point of that is Plaxo Online, where you get all your information anywhere you want. And it's the same information that you have in your, in your address book elsewhere. And um, that's the thing that we were working on for, as the point of this when you set up all your sync and stuff as well. And so this is just a couple of, uh, of screenshots of sort of what it looks like. So it's, it's a sort of uh, Ajax desktop almost, um, where you have multiple, so I've got my address book over on the side, and this is sort of fine as you type, sort of scroll through the list kind of thing. And on the right, I have a full calendar, and you can see there's little tabs up there for tasks and notes and other things. And down along the bottom, we have what we call our sync dashboard, where I can see all the different places that I'm syncing with, and I can go in and add, and add more places. And this whole space is sort of reconfigurable, so it, it sort of loads this initial data. But say I want to go in and click on one of my contacts, I can get it to blow up and use the entire space. And so you can see here now, we're showing additional contact info, and we've got this little Yahoo map uh, mashup in there. So you can see where they live, and you can get driving directions. And you, you know, there's different tabs for other pieces of information. And this is all sort of loaded and redrawn and so forth dynamically. And, uh, and then also even you can pull in other applications. Like we've got this new application now called Plaxo Pulse that uh, helps find all the people in your address book who are putting up photos on Flickr or blogging or doing Amazon or Twittering and sort of give you a web-wide news feed of all the stuff that they're doing. And again, it's sort of easy for us to just drop that in. And the first time you go to it, it kind of loads on demand within this container. Um, so that all looks well and good, and it, and it did ship. And uh, so, I mean, I'm not here, here standing here uh, telling you that it didn't work, but I will tell you uh, that it came very perilously close to getting killed and not shipping uh, because we wrote all this stuff, and getting it performant enough was way, way harder than we thought. And uh, we came very close to deciding that we had to completely start over from scratch. And I'm sure, uh, you know, Yahoo has also done so much great work in sort of pushing the envelope uh, in their different products. There may have been similar identity crises like this. So you guys may be able to relate to some of this. But if not, hopefully at least uh, you'll come away from this realizing how to avoid the mistakes that we made. Um, so I was going to take you through a little sort of emotional timeline of how this worked. So uh, last spring, we were thinking, you know, we hadn't really done a version of uh, the whole rev of the service in a while. We'd done a bunch of incremental releases. And we were thinking, let's, let's do something great. Let's really rebuild this from the ground up, and especially on the web. You know, we'd done all this sort of pre-Ajax, Ajax stuff with iframes, and it was kind of hacky. And now we've got all these great tools, and let's do it really for, for real. And so we, 
you know, we just sort of let everybody kind of let's let's solve all the problems we've always wanted to solve. Let's build this really great UI. Let's you know add all these new features. Just you know wireframe, wireframe, product design. No feature was too you know just throw them all in. It's gonna be great. And by fall, we we decided we built this really cool setup, and we were like, okay, we've got this huge web dev team. We just bought this web calendar startup, and so we had a whole bunch of fresh talent, and so we we're like, let's throw them all at this and just start cranking out code. And um, you know, getting towards winter, I mean, we we written you know a meg and a half of JavaScript code or something, and we were thinking, okay, well, we, we've built a lot of stuff. It's pretty slow, but yeah, we'll do a week or two of profiling, and you know, ship it. We'll be good to go. And the idea was to ship it before Christmas. Um, so Christmas went by, and uh, January and February, and um, by March, uh, we were starting to get a little bit nervous because we'd sort of done a lot of what we thought were the obvious tricks, and this thing was still just completely bogging the browser down because it was so big and complicated. And we were starting to feel a little bit nervous, but you know we kept pushing. Um, a month later, you know this is when we started getting to this point of saying, you know maybe this is maybe what maybe we were naive to think that web browsers could do all of this. You know maybe. Uh, this is just the wrong way to go. Maybe we should, you know, break it all down and do a sort of Plexo light and go back to do some PHP pages or something. And and I think then maybe because of almost coming to this breaking point, we sort of did a last, you know, heroic effort and unlearned a lot of things we thought we'd learned in the past and and finally got it sort of fast enough to ship. So uh, if you go use it now, I, I won't claim it's the absolute fastest thing out there, but it's pretty good and it's certainly like night and day compared to where it was when we first started working on this. So I tried to figure out after we did this, um, you know, where did we go wrong, right? <laughs> how did th how did this happen to us? And I think you know, with hindsight being 2020, um, I, the biggest thing is you know we we didn't think we were going to have to take performance seriously from day one. We basically thought you know web browsers have these great capabilities. We're a really smart group of engineers. Let's start by saying designing a great product, and we'll figure out all the things needed to make it work well. You know, we're, we can we can make the web browser bend to our needs. And, and only in retrospect do I realize how important it is when you're designing in the web, because of the way the web is, how important performance has to be taken from day one if you ever want to ship a fast app. Um, and, and specifically because you know, the browser, and I'll talk more about this, you know, it is a very limited platform. And it's being stretched way beyond its comfort zone. And if you don't take that seriously, then you'll be in trouble. Um, another thing that uh, I think is, is much clearer in retrospect is we weren't using this New app daily as we were building it, we were still on the old version, especially because you know it was all our like personal information and stuff. But and in, in, as a result, we never really felt that pain as users until we'd already been working on it for many months, and then by then it was it was much harder to change course. Whereas with some of our newer products, we've started using it internally almost from day one, and you know you you care about things like speed and responsiveness a lot as a user, and so you start to feel that viscerally at a much earlier stage. Um, and then and and related to that was you know we were we were very concerned about making a really a wow product that was going to have a lot of really great features. And each of the feature ideas was a really good one, but there wasn't this healthy back and forth that I now realize is really critical about what are the performance implications of each of those features and you know how, how much speed are you willing to trade to get this extra thing in here. And then one last thing that I'll, I'll talk about later is uh, in addition to making the app actually faster, there are a lot of things you can do to make it feel snappier. And those turn out to matter a huge amount, a lot more than we realized, in terms of the user's overall feeling of how well an app works. Uh, and by the way, all these slides are online on my website at josephsmart.com, so don't feel like you have to take too many notes or anything. But um, okay, so the, the reason I titled this talk uh, "Everything You've Been Taught Is Wrong" is because it wasn't fixing these problems wasn't just a matter of learning a bunch of things that we didn't know because we were naive. We, you know, we've built a lot of software before. We were a pretty experienced engineering team. We built a lot of web apps before. I think it was, it was specifically that a lot of assumptions that we had as engineers about good design patterns and good trade-offs and, and how you're supposed to build applications don't actually translate into the web. The, the assumptions are wrong because the web is a fundamentally different environment. Um, it's a different runtime. It's a different language. And as a result, we had to unlearn a lot of things that we'd been taught and kind of recalibrate to what we think of as kind of the zen of designing for the web. And in retrospect, I think Doug had talked about this a while ago about you know sort of you can make JavaScript be whatever you want, but what's best to do is to make it what it wants to be. And I think that really is the lesson that we sort of came back to about the web in general is sort of you know if you can learn what works well and do that as opposed to just trying to bend it to your will and fighting uphill all the time, then you'll be much better off. And so you know basically. I think the ways in this happened was because in this sort of latest round of euphoria over Ajax, which is I guess now going has been going for a couple of years, um, you know everybody felt like okay now we have this amazing tool set we can finally make 
web pages that are as rich as the desktop applications we're used to. You know, we can download arbitrary data, we can draw arbitrary things on screen, we have events, we can do all this great stuff. And so let's just import all this knowledge we had from the desktop world about the kind of applications and experiences we want to build and the kind of programming models we want to use. Let's start building in class hierarchies and interfaces and getters and setters and, you know, event queues and all this sort of stuff and just, you know, hey, because we can make JavaScript do it, it's a malleable language. And I think that that's basically, just to cut to the punchline, I'll go through a lot of examples of specifically what we learned, and, but I think just so you have the high level picture in your head, I think that that's a fundamentally wrong assumption. Um, because like I say, the browsers are, they weren't designed to do that, right? Desktops are designed to run desktop applications, but web browsers are not designed to run these rich Ajax applications, they're designed to run web pages. And uh, you know, so you're constantly in this area where you're hitting up against design limitations that were never really foreseen by the authors. And maybe that'll change over time, but it's certainly not the way it is today, and I think for the foreseeable future. Um, and in particular, JavaScript is, is, is very different than almost any of the other languages you work in because you're actually downloading the raw source code to the client and running it every time they run the page, right? Almost every other language is compiled ahead of time or at least compiled just in time. But in JavaScript, it's not, right? You're downloading the source code, and then every time you run the web page, whether the JavaScript is cached or not, you're having to read it all in and parse through it all, and, and then you know, and interpret it all. And, and there's no opcode cache, and there's no JIT. And so like, you're paying a cost for every line of source code that you write. And that means that a lot of the trade-offs you've made as programmers in other languages where each line of source code didn't have a cost don't necessarily translate into this world. And that was kind of a, a, an aha moment for us. And, and I guess hopefully if you're here and hopefully because you work at Yahoo, I don't have to convince you of this, but um, you know, it's really, really important to have apps be fast. Users care so much more about speed than they care about almost any other feature you could throw at them. And you know, if, when you use really fast apps, it's like a joy, right? You almost don't even care what they do. It's just like it's so good, you just feel like you know, a superstar. And, and, then, and, the, and the opposite is absolutely true too, right? If you're dealing with a really dog slow app, whether it's on a web browser or on your as, uh, desktop, you know, it's just like it's the most painful experience in the world and you just can't get done what you want to get done and it kind of like slows the RPMs in your brain down and you like, again, you almost don't care what it does. And you can almost do a little experiment in your head where you would like ask your hypothetical users, you know, would you rather that the app be faster and I could, if I had to take out some of the features to do it, they would almost always say yes, right? And I think this is particularly ironic given that Ajax initially, I think the excitement was around responsiveness. It was, it was, hey, now we don't have to refresh the entire web page every time the user clicks on something. We can just do a little local update. But I think most people, including us, took that to mean, oh, we can now build vastly more complicated apps on the web, and which are often less responsive than the simple ones we started with. And so I think it's important to kind of remember that. So I wanted to distill the sort of, you know, dozens of, of individual lessons that that we learned going through this process um, into you know, some sort of coherent narrative that is sort of what we learned coming out of this. And so thinking about it, I think it's, it's pretty clear that what we did was we ended up coming up with an internal mantra that allowed us to make high-performance web apps going forward. And so that's, that's how I want to sort of spend the rest of the time here is sort of translate this into what I think of as the high-performance JavaScript mantra that every designer and engineer should hold in their heads. And that is be lazy to be responsive, to be pragmatic, and to be vigilant. And so I'm going to spend the rest of the talk uh, going through what I mean by each of these. So let's start with being lazy. What I mean by that is, um, if you haven't tried it lately, if you load a blank web page in your web browser, it's really fast. I mean, it just like comes up and like boom, you know, it's really, really fast. And so, you know, if you can think about it like a, a blank web page is over here, and you know, if your web app is slow, it's somewhere over here. And so you kind of, generally speaking, the way to be faster is to kind of go that way. You know what I mean? And, and if, if your app is slow, it's because you're doing stuff that's slow. I mean, that may not sound obvious, but that's, that's the case, right? And so the less you can do, the better. And you know, the thing about laziness, the reason why it's so important for all kinds of uh, optimization work is that um, if you can get away with not doing something now, you know, worst case, you'll have to do it later, but you may not have to ever do it at all. So the first thing I would say is, uh, this may be one of the most obvious and one of the hardest to follow lessons, is to just try to write less code. Because like I said, you're paying for every line of source code that you write. And it's very hard to take a lot of code and make it run really fast. Um, and so, you know, and, and, and 
as we've learned um, you know, from Yahoo's examples, like, don't assume that caching solves the problem because A, it's surprisingly common how, off, how often your people will come to you with an empty cache, especially if you're revving your product all the time. Um, and also, because like I said, like when we loaded Plaxo the first time after we built all that stuff, the slowest thing was not the download speed, it was not the drawing the DOM stuff, it was just the amount of time that it took the CPU to crank through and parse all the JavaScript that it had in cache. You know, you just see the CPU spike and just stay there for several seconds while it was parsing all that stuff. And it's like, what are you going to do about that, right? I mean, you basically just have to write less code. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's not just about size. You know, the, the more you write, the more things go wrong, the more you have to maintain, the more edge cases you have to fix. And so there's a zen of saying, how can we do less? How can we do less? That is, I think, very important for or if you want things to actually be performant. And so the question is, how big is too big? Well, so I went and looked around um, a lot of apps on the web, and, and this is maybe is a few months old, but this is sort of to give you an idea of the sort of the uncompressed size of the JavaScript you download when you run a lot of apps like this. Um, and it basically, once you get over 500K, you start to be in trouble. And, and I noticed the browsers start to, it seems like they start to bog down faster than linear after about 500K in terms of how much time it takes to parse and deal with it all. And so we were over here on the left, and we were kind of nervous about it, um, and we, after all the work we did, we sort of were able to cut it in half, but then we also do a lot of loading on demand stuff so that what you actually get when you start out is, is now pretty, pretty respectable. But so that I, I would say, you know, try to shoot for 500K, and unless, if you're gonna be over 500K, you better be a pretty ambitious app that you're building. So, and then of course, um, you wanna follow, once you've written as little code as possible, you wanna ship it down as, as compactly as possible. And so, this is, this is all pretty much stuff I learned from uh, Yahoo, but, you know, make sure that you use a minifier, and we also feel like the, going the extra step of trying to obfuscate the code is, is more trouble than it's worth. Um, and then, what, one thing that was sort of funny is, uh, we'd written our own little internal uh, sort of logging framework so that we could have, you know, messages coming out as the app was running. And then we said, okay, when we ship it to the users, we'll just set the log level to zero, and so no messages will come out. But it actually, we still had all the JavaScript code in there to do all the logging lines. And when we looked at it, it was actually like 5 or 10% of the entire code base was logging lines. And so we wrote some regexes in our build tool to go and strip all that out, and that, that had a big win. So you guys, you know, you may have something similar like that. Um, and another thing where it was a lot of easy win was a lot of unnecessary OOP boilerplate where, again, we were just sort of thinking that's how you're supposed to write good code. It sort of looks like Java, and, but, you know, JavaScript is like this incredibly open language, and so in most cases, it was actually not providing any level of protection. It was just providing a lot of unnecessary code. And then the last thing to say is um, dependency on third-party libraries. So definitely one of the biggest things in our code base when we looked at it was we were using both Dojo and YUI, and... Um, you know, those are both great packages, um, but it's important to remember that in general, they're solving uh, a more general class of problems than you necessarily need for your app. And so almost by definition, they're going to have to do it in bigger, slower ways than you might need for your specific app. And so uh, my recommendation would be to use them kind of like scaffolding, like when you're first starting, use them, get your thing up and running as soon as possible, like work out the use cases and stuff. And then as you're profiling it and you start to notice slow parts, you can start to selectively rewrite pieces of it in just the sort of stripped down form that you need without all the assumptions that have to be carried in the full library and then you can uh, jettison a lot of that dependency code. Um, and then of course once you've uh, done it, what you can't do is just load all the JavaScript at up front when the page loads because you'll do this, drop this atom bomb of JavaScript on the browser and the CPU will spike and your users will be unhappy. So it's really important to try to load it as needed. Um, so, you know, you saw like in, in Plaxo there, there's different tabs and things like that and you, you don't want to have to load any of that code until you need it, right? It's being lazy. And so um, I, you, you can do things like Dojo and others have this notion of being able to break into classes and modules and then you sort of require the code as you need it and then you know, if, if it'll check if the code has already been loaded, and if not, it'll go out and make a little XML HTTP request and eval the code and pull it in, and so you can kind of load your code on demand as necessary. Um, and in practice, what you need to do is actually take your classes and sort of bundle them into packages because you can't, if you try to download 20 JavaScript files at the same time, you know, you only get two connections at a time, and so the, the round trips will kill you. Um, but you can basically just sort of chunk it up, so, you know, when you go into the week view of the calendar, we'll get all that code, and when you, you know, pull up a light box for settings, we'll load that code and that sort of thing. Um, one little thing we did, there, you know, some of this stuff is you just sort of have to fiddle with it, fiddle with it and find what works for you. Um, one thing we did that I thought was pretty useful, and you guys may have something more sophisticated here, but um, we wanted our engineers to be working in the same environment 
of code as we'd be shipping it with these packages, but we, uh, you didn't want to have to rebuild your packaging every time you change the line of JavaScript while you're working. And so what we did was we had a directory where all the built packages were out there, and we just uh, schmodded it unwritable and then set an error handler in Apache to regenerate the files um, if those weren't found. And so every time you'd load the page, it would try to find the files, it would fall through, and it would regenerate them from your source code. And so you would just work uh, you know, like you could just change source code. And then when we shipped it, it would be exactly the same environment. So a lot of this sounds like maybe hard work, but uh, this, this guy Ryan Moore who did a lot of this, like we call him Roger Moore, um, he, you, know, you say you got to work hard at being lazy sometimes. So if you do this once, then you know, everything else will be a lot easier for you. We, you know, I gave this talk like two days before the Simpsons movie came out, and uh, we'd, we'd been making all these Simpson avatars for each other around the office, and so it, it seemed like too good a timing not to sprinkle the talk with Simpson avatars. OK, so download the code as late as possible. And then the other thing is draw everything as late as possible. Because as I'm sure you know, like the other thing that makes web browsers really slow is when you have a lot of objects in the DOM, in, in the page, everything just starts to bog down. And so I think the general rule of thumb there is if, if you don't see it on screen, you shouldn't be drawing it. And so for, there's a lot of hidden UI that you can kind of toggle on, or there's tabs, or there's things you can scroll down. And all of that stuff you should try to draw as late as possible. To, because A, you're going to do less work to draw it. And then B, there's less stuff in the DOM. Um, and so, you know, I think that the, the trick then is just to wait and draw it the first time and then cache it. So if you need to show it again, you know, you've already got it there. Um, and then, of course, you get into these situations of how do I keep that information up to date? Um, and, you're, and you're tempted, you know, having been taught how to do model view controller style applications that, you know, you should, whenever the model changes, you should fire events and you should redraw the UI. Well, a lot of times that UI is going to be off screen, and so you could end up doing a lot of work just trying to keep that stuff up to date behind the scenes. And what we found is, in general, that's a bad idea. What you should do is instead just invalidate it and wait for it to be shown again, and then just act like it's never been drawn. It'll, it'll redraw next time it gets shown. And so you end up doing a lot less work um, than trying to keep it, again, it's, it's part of this everything you've been taught is wrong. And similar uh, with how much do you update in the UI when the model changes. Again, it's very tempting to say, oh, I'm going to be really smart. And like, if this guy changes his phone number, I'm just going to change that one little string. I'm not going to redraw all the contact information. And we found, again, in most cases, the amount of code that it takes to you know, attach handles everywhere and walk the DOM and find that stuff and do the updates and keep it consistent, it's so much easier and in most cases just as effective to say, I'm just going to invalidate it and redraw it when something like that happens. So to give you an example of how this looks in Plaxo, so this is the screenshot I showed you before. So say I want to go open up my brother's contact info. It pops down and shows sort of the first few like most important fields of contact information there. And so that was just drawn um, just in time. And then you know if I go back and forth, it's cached it so it's really fast. And then I can click and say I want more contact info. And then it expands out and takes over the whole space. And again, we wait to draw this whole expanded Chrome until the first time you do it. And then you know, we, we draw the contact info in. We, we only draw the Yahoo map after that's loaded. And you can see there's multiple tabs, but we've only drawn the tab that you're seeing. And so if I click over to the work in, from the home info, then we'll draw that stuff in demand. And again, we're caching as we go. So now I can go back and forth. And those really fast. And then if I want to go and change my contacts and pick a different you know, category or folder menu, we load that UI. In fact, we, only, we wait and load the data the first time as well. And, and, and you get the idea. OK, so that's a, a lot of work that will allow you to then be lazy. And your users will be happy that you are lazy. So the, the counterpoint to being lazy is that you need to be responsive. right? Th this is like the ideal situation. You don't do anything until you're asked to. But as soon as you're asked to, you're like, yes, boss, I'll get right on that. You know? and, uh, and so that's really important, too. Um, one of the most important places to be responsive is when the app is first loading. This is something that I think you know, users judge the speed of an app a lot by how fast it takes to load because they come to an app trying to get a task done, right? And they want to get their task done. If they're sitting there while you're loading your complicated desktop framework, they're not very impressed. Um, so again, some, some wisdom from uh, Yahoo, you know, put your CSS at the top and put your JavaScript at the bottom so that you can see something on the page right away and the JavaScript doesn't block the UI. And then as soon as possible, try to draw some sort of placeholder UI so that it looks like your app has responded. And then load it, draw it all in in stages right? so that it looks like something's happening. Basically, don't make the user wait and have nothing happen for any large periods of time. That's what, when they say your app is slow, that's largely what they mean. So again, an example of how we did this at Plaxo. And again, the last example, this example, these are both things that we did not have in the first version we built. We had to go back and figure out to build these back in in order to solve the problem. So the very first thing we do before we load any JavaScript or anything is we have this little loading message just so we know something has happened. Then as soon as possible, we throw in the Chrome basic background. 
Then we sort of start to throw in the outside Chrome, but we haven't loaded any module specific code yet. Then we start to load in the individual module JavaScript and draw that. You start to load in some internal state. And then as the you know, data comes back, we draw that in stages. And so, but the net net is that, you know, this, it looks like something's happening all the time and it sort of all kind of comes to life. And you can imagine if, if you didn't see this until it was fully drawn, you know, it would seem like ungodly slow. But the fact that we're just loading it in the stages and that you're seeing something right away makes it look very responsive. And so um, the question is, how do you do that? And uh, this is something that we were surprised to learn that um, when you're going through your JavaScript code and manipulating the DOM, in general, it won't actually redraw until after you yield your thread of execution. Because in JavaScript, you're still competing with the UI thread. And so what you have to do is periodically yield and give the uh, browser a chance to, to draw things. So like if in your code, you said like, draw a loading message and then do a bunch of work and then draw the real final thing. If you do that all straight through, you'll never see the loading message. And of course, JavaScript um, doesn't have exactly the most sophisticated set of uh, multi-threading tools. But what you do have is this little thing called set timeout, where you can basically yield for zero milliseconds back to yourself. And then it'll give the browser a chance to breathe and draw something. And so generally, what you want to do is to, when the user clicks on something, you know, draw some UI that shows some acknowledgment ASAP. And then set timeout zero back to yourself, and then do the rest of the work. And you know you can use a closure if you need to maintain state across that. Um, and the the metaphor I like to use is um, a TiVo. If you guys you know you all use TiVo, right? Or if you haven't, you know, go use it. It's like the greatest thing ever. Um, is you know whenever you click on something in TiVo, the very first thing that it does is it like puts this big yellow check mark next to your item, and it goes boop. This very like happy acknowledgement beep, right? And then, and if you actually watch, it may take two or three seconds to like delete the program or bring up the info, but it always feels so snappy because as soon as you've done anything, you get the little padook and you're happy, right? So you be like the, the TiVo. Um, one last little message. This is something that I actually am sort of loath to accept, except that it really makes a big difference, is um, when you're clicking on things to have things work, um, you actually get the on mouse down event like about 100 milliseconds before you get the on click event because it has to wait for it to come back up and realize that it was a click. And so you can get a jump on the event, and it, things look a lot more responsive. Um, I actually, the reason I didn't like this is because I'm one of those people who sometimes tries to like click on something, and then like I realize it was the wrong thing, and I kind of like want to pull my mouse out of the way and let go and hope that it like forgives me. And you kind of lose that, but uh, apparently most users aren't like that. Um, <laughs> and in fact, now that I realize this, if you go around and look at other sites, it's like amazing how many sites are using that trick. And so you almost kind of have to if you want to really push the envelope. And this URL, if you, these talks are on my, these uh, slides are on my uh, site. This is a little demo I put together. It's, it does the same thing, exact same code, but in one case it uses yielding, and in the other case it doesn't. And it's just amazing what the difference is. And then, uh, so the other thing that tends to be slow where you want to be responsive is when you're communicating with the server, and you know that that's something that you can't always control the speed of, and so it's really important to. Uh, cache as much as possible. So, like, if, you know, if you're scrolling around in your address book, you you don't want to have to keep reloading that information from the server. You want to sort of remember what you already loaded. Um, and actually, I was thinking about this. Um, you know, it's it's generally better to uh, sort of abstract all your code that talks to the server uh, into sort of a data manager layer and let the UI just talk to the data manager because then it can figure out what it's got in cache and what it doesn't, and the data and the UI layer doesn't have to care. Um, and that actually this, this pattern um, of Ajax apps being kind of like a window onto like a large list of data is actually very common across lots of different apps. If you think even about calendar, right, you may be looking at a particular day or week or month, and you're sort of, but you're moving forward and back in time, there's this huge amount of data. Or an address book, or like in Yahoo Mail, you've got this long mail list, and they sort of do all the smart stuff about not loading the full list. And so if you can actually keep your JavaScript data cache um, as a range, then you know you can often get advantages where you're like you know half of what's on the screen has been loaded and half hasn't, so you only have to request the other half. Or sometimes the entire thing may be in cache, but you loaded it in different chunks. You know you resize the window or something. You've already got the data, and so this is actually can be a very useful um, thing to do. And of course, again, you have to worry about cache invalidation. And I would give the same advice I gave before, which is we, we were very we tried to be very clever about doing all these local cache updates. So like as you'd edit your contact info, we could like go in and edit the cache version and not have to refetch it. But again, you can get yourself in trouble that way and you end up with a lot of code. And because you had to worry about the uncached state anyway, it's generally better advice just to say when you, if you can't do something easy, then just you know invalidate the cache and next time you'll pull the data down again. And some of this got a little bit complicated, but one of the guys um, that we hired from HipCal, that was this startup we acquired, um, was a math major and loved all this data structure stuff. And so he was excited to be able to work on this, um, even though you know web development doesn't always have the most complicated data structures. I call him Glenn Fittich, but nobody else seems to. Anyway.
<laughs> okay, so that's 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 how you can be responsive. Um, all right, so hopefully that uh, hasn't been too uh, much to hold in your head at once. The last two sessions are a little lighter, but I think just as important. Um, the first one is to say there, there's lots of things that we think we're taught as engineers about how you're supposed to build applications and what things are good and what things are bad. And a lot of those have performance implications. And you have to learn when it's OK to sort of flaunt these rules in order to make your app fast, because otherwise, you're just adding additional constraints that make an already hard problem even harder. And, and nobody's, your users certainly aren't benefiting from that. So for example, you know, it, may, it may seem painful, but use inner HTML. Don't use DOM manipulation. It's just so much faster. And you know, don't build up string concatenation stuff. Put it all into an array and join it with an empty string at the last second. So you just do one memory copy. Um, you know, don't do all this fancy stuff of like changing your CSS styles dynamically into the style sheet so that things get updated. Just go in and set the style dot whatever properties, and don't worry about the fact that it might be hard coded in two different places. Just like get over it. These are all things that are otherwise so painful and slow. Um, Reflow is a particularly big problem. It's really tempting to sort of say, I want my app to fill the entire screen, but I can't exactly do it with percentage layouts because it's got all this complicated state. And so I'm just going to trap the on resize event and then redraw everything every time it's resized. Again, that just tends to be very, very slow. And so if you can work with your designers and figure out a way that it can resize using the browser's native you know, resizing stuff, you'll just be so much happier. Um, and one thing in general is you know, remember that JavaScript is still like a normal programming language. So for example, like all the string operations involve memory allocation on the heap, and that's really slow. And so like when we found when we were debugging, especially the third party libraries, there was all this stuff where it was nice, cute code that was you know, doing lots of substring and things like that um, that ended up creating all this unnecessary memory copying. And so that can be a, a big area where you can save as well. And one thing we learned actually from our friends at Mebo, which turned out to be pretty cool, is if you do need to do a lot of DOM manipulation, it's much, much faster if you take the node off the DOM and then do all the manipulation and then stick it back on the DOM. Because I guess you must like avoid a lot of intermediate reflow or things like that. And if you do it all without yielding, your users won't even notice. And it's way faster. Um, and then same goes for all this stuff about global functions and IDs, you know, you're taught like you need to, there's, there's a shared namespace, you can be polluting it, and so you have to make sure that everything has these special IDs and you never want to have the same thing on the page twice. And so you do this stuff where you give it a class name and then you inject it into the DOM and you go back and find it and you have a handle to it. And again, it, that, there's times where that's necessary, but it's generally a lot slower. And so there's plenty of cases, I think, where you, know, you only have one settings dialog. And so it's perfectly reasonable. It's not going to be like a mashup on some other page to like have your settings dialog come up, right? So just give it an ID, have a global function when you click on it, and you know, your life will be a lot easier. Same with the on-click handler stuff. It's like you know, be unobtrusive. Don't attach your handlers in your code, and then you know, have a you know, event queue so that everybody can register as listeners. Again, sometimes that's necessary, but lots of time you're, just, you're having one function that gets called when you click, and it's just much better to say on click equals do this function. Um, and so just don't, I guess what I was don't, don't feel like because, just because you've been taught that that's evil means you have to like have all these additional weights on you while you're trying to make your app fast. Like make your app fast and be pragmatic. In particular, what made a big difference for us was if, you, if you're drawing your code with inner HTML, then you don't have DOM references to hand on to, right? And so if you want to, for example, drop in some UI that has a button, and then you want to have that button on click do something, what you have to do is give the button a class name, and then uh, do inner HTML, then grab the root node, and then walk down and try to find that element with that class name so that you have a reference to it so that you can then attach a handler to it. And when you're doing that for something that's just, you know, first of all, that's slow. But second of all, if it's something like in our address book where you know, every single one of the contacts has multiple things like that you have to attach, that ended up being one of our biggest bottlenecks was just the amount of time spent walking the DOM and looking for nodes. There's no sort of shortcut for that. And so what we did instead was um, we had it all, we had a global function um, that would say, you know, like on contact clicked and it would just pass the ID. And then we do have an instantiated you know, object instance that manages the address book, but the global function could just grab that instance and walk down and call the appropriate function on it. And then all the code just in the inner HTML, you could just say on click equals on contact clicked of ID, and it would just draw in and hook itself up when you did the inner HTML, and there was no walking and no attaching events, and that made a tremendous difference. So certainly if there's areas where that's repeated, you know, if it's just a, if it's just a one-off, it's not a huge deal, but we found that that was one of the things that we were spending the most time doing. 
So yeah, the point there was if a, there's a lot of general purpose code for, um, for this thing I was saying about walking the DOM and trying to find a particular node with a particular tag name and a particular class name. And it's again, it's one of those cases where the general case may be a lot worse than your specific case. So you know, we noticed like uh, code, I think we were using Dojo for this, but it would like um, try to find all the nodes of a given type, right? And then you only need one, and so you'd want to be able to fail fast as soon as you found it. And like it was saying, well, it could have any or multiple class names, so it would take all the class strings and like break them up and try to find one. And we, c we were able to do things that were just a lot more suited for our needs. We would say like, we only know there's, there's only going to be one link in there, or one button, and so just go down by tag name as soon as you find it, bail out. And so again, it's just like, don't feel like you're beholden to this general purpose code. Make sure that it's doing only what you really need to. Another one of these things, these are all things that we didn't do at first because we, they sort of felt dirty to us and we had to kind of learn to get over it. Um, so, you know, it's very tempting when you have a Ajax app to say, I'm basically going to download a blank web page, pull down my JavaScript, and then set up this whole UI framework and draw everything in JavaScript, right? The problem is that ju it's just very hard to make that fast. It's very hard to get that initial load time to look good. Um, because your users want to see something right away. And particularly, you know, with Plaxo, I'll show you that, that sort of basic Chrome, there's just not a lot of HTML code there, so it was kind of like inexcusable that that would take like multiple seconds to show up, right? Because if you'd actually like saved it out as HTML and loaded it, it would be like instantaneous. And so what we had to do was realize that some of that stuff you have to sort of inline in the initial response of the CGI. But one of the things that was actually helpful for that was because we did this thing I mentioned earlier about taking the uh, data layer and abstracting that so that the UI layer just sort of said, hey, I need the first 10 contacts in the address book. Then we were able to take some of those and actually uh, inline them into the CGI and basically save the JSON that came back out into the actual HTML page. And then the data manager could use that the first time it was necessary. So the rest of the code didn't have to change. It would just wake up and it would magically already have the data it needed for all the calls, especially the stuff you know you're going to do on load every single time, right? There's no sense in having the extra round trips. It's strictly slower than just having it be uh, packaged into the actual page. And same with the initial UI. And again, sometimes that leads to a little bit of duplication of UI um, on the you know server side and then back in the JavaScript, but uh, compared to what? Compared to having a slow app, it's not worth it. Okay, so those are all examples of things where I think it's really important. I'm not saying abandon all the things you've been taught. I'm saying remember that these things you've been taught have consequences, and so think about when they're really helping you and when they're hurting you. And the last thing to say is, I think this is where uh, Steve and I really connected on our talks, which is to say that you know, it really is in your hands as designers and engineers to make fast web pages. And you know, going back to the blank web page being fast thing, right? all your projects start out as blank web pages. And so if they're slow, it's because you let them get slow. right? You let, you let too many features and UI and stuff get in there to the point where it wasn't fast. But if you can hold the line, you know, then you can keep your app fast and you can just sort of refuse to let it not be fast, right? And if you want to ship a fast app, that is actually kind of the mentality you need to have. So only you can prevent slow web apps. So what do you do? So first of all, you know, remember that performance is important. So, you know, profile all early and often and, you know, standard profiling advice, pays, which is, you know, premature optimization is the root of all evil. So measure, 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 and then just go after the bottlenecks one by one. Um, the Firebug profiler is amazing. If you haven't used Firebug, I don't know why. And of course now, I think it's so clever that YSlow was built into Firebug because that just makes it even better and so useful. But even simple stuff, just, just putting in some little timestamps throughout your code and like taking diffs to kind of find the big swaths of code that are slow or just commenting out big sections of code and seeing how fast it loads, like these things help a lot because it's not always obvious. In fact, it's usually not obvious where the slow parts in your code are. Um, and just remember also that you know browsers are caching things and they're bogging down and they're leaking memory. So if you really want to have an accurate timing, make sure you're having the same environment every time you restart the browser each time or you average runs or things like that. Um, so if you haven't seen it, this is what Firebug's profiler looks like. You just turn it on, load your app, and then it'll show you all the functions and how long they spent, and it's it's great. It it, it can be a little tricky when you're loading code on demand. There's some things you have to do to help make that not so hairy, but it it's great. Um, and then yeah, like I said. I really believe that if you want to ship a fast app, and you should because users only like fast apps, um, then you know you should make sure that this is an important ongoing discussion from day one. And so, you know, 
for each feature, it's very tempting, especially when you work with product managers who, as they should, aren't thinking too much about the technical implications. They're just thinking about what the user wants. They may come to you with a design that you're like, OK, I can find some way of like twisting the browser into a double helix to make this happen, but it's really not the way the browser wants to work. And if you can have that back and forth discussion with your man product manager and say, well, if we did it slightly differently, this layout you know, might not be exactly what you wanted, but it would be a lot easier for the browser to work. It would be a lot less code. I think the problem is sometimes as engineers were taught like, our, our point of pride, our like, thing that we do is to tell the people, OK, you, you, know, you can have exactly what you want. I'll do all this complicated work, and I'll figure out some way to have it anyway. But you know, implicit in that is that they also want the app to be fast. And, and they don't necessarily know what's going to be fast or slow. And so as you go, as you start to feel pain implementing it, I think it's absolutely incumbent upon you as an engineer who is one of their jobs is to be sh building a fast app to push back and say, hey, this is actually kind of hard. Can we change this and to have that dialogue and say, you know, is this, is, this real, is this feature really worth the speed cost that we're going to suffer because of it? Does that make sense? And, and you know, sometimes it's going to be up to you to be the guy who says that, to say, hey, I'm worried about the performance here. Because it's, performance is like, it's kind of not exactly a feature. It's like the unfeature, right? There's no, there's no particular thing you write which is speed. It's, it's, it's something that you start with and lose if you're not careful. And so it's, it's, your, important, it's your job to help be vigilant about that. And, and I, I'd say actually even more strongly than that, um, if, if you really want to ship a high-performance app, then you have to say, I'm going to ship a high-performance app, and I'm going to add as many features as I can sub, such that it stays a high-performance app and not the other way around. And, and that's also something that I, I thought was very intuitive. I was, I was actually firmly on the other side because, you know, I was the guy who was running this crack web dev team at Plaxo. I was like, hey, give us anything. We're smart guys. We'll figure out how to make it work, you know? And then when we started having these performance problems and, you know, people started saying, hey, well, we should start taking these features out, I was like, well, that's no good. I, the whole, you know, people aren't using Plaxo because they want to have a fast app with no features. They're using it because they want to have this cool address book and calendar and stuff, right? So you know, we, we'd be like defeating the purpose of the exercise to pull out the features, even though that's what's making it slow. And it was only after that basically you know, got to the point where we couldn't ship the app that it made me realize that, no, you know, users do want a fast app. And so you know, let's start with that as actually the highest priority and build in as many features as we can under that budget. And so this is, this is our founders, Todd and Cam, who are, are very performance-minded people. They were always saying this to me. And so I now always see them sitting on my shoulder saying, performance first, features second. And again, that's one of those things you, I sort of had to unlearn. Um, by the way, if you don't know what Todd and Cam look like, I couldn't resist. This is, what they, this is like, I think, the best avatars I've did. That's like totally spot on. Anyway. <laughs> OK. So being vigilant. So basically, remember that web apps start fast and get slow. And it is absolutely your job as an engineer to realize when it's going slow and to push back and make sure that there, it's not that you can't implement it. It's just that there has to be a healthy dialogue about what are you getting for this performance trade-off. All right, so let me wrap up now. I know that's a lot of material. But hopefully, there's a common thread here, which is you know, <laughs> if, if you're working on a project now that is in this situation, maybe some of these will help you get out of it. And if you're not, then I really hope that this will help you avoid getting in the situation that we got in. So basically, I think I could sum it all up by saying, you should try to make the browser happy, and it will make you happy. You know, your users want you to ship an app that they can use that they like. They don't want you to ship six months late because you spent all this time fighting uphill against a browser because you had these ideas about how you're going to do it. None of that is providing any end user value, right? So just whenever possible, I would say go with the grain and design your app around that. And I think the metaphor that has become truer for me over time is to think of a web browser more like a mobile phone than like a desktop. You know, if you talk to mobile developers, it's like this, but even worse, right? It's like there's all these different platforms, and they're so slow and underpowered, and it's like it's all you can do to keep the thing from tripping over itself. And you know, it, it almost gets to the point where you say, like, why are you such a masochist, right? Like, why are you even working on this? And people say that to me too. I tell some of my friends who aren't web dev guys all the like crazy things we had to do to make Plaxo 3 work, and they were like. Dude, that's ridiculous. Like, why not go work on a problem where you know you're bounded more by your creativity than by how to like make IE6 not suck, you know? And um, <laughs> and and I guess the answer is that you know it's still the case that you know everybody has a web browser. It's like the deployment dream, right? And so if you if you want to be in the consumer space, it's mobile even more so, right? It, everybody everybody has a cell phone, and so it's just it's the only game in town. Right? So it absolutely is the case that you can still do the most good for your users by living in this environment. And that's why it's all the more important to realize how to not make your job more painful than it has to be so that you really can capitalize on this wonderful thing. I mean, it's, it's an amazing platform. And we can build these amazing applications that everybody can use right away. 
Um, and so I think it's just important to say that, you know, and maybe because the web browsers are so malleable, uh, it's, it's actually made it harder for us to realize that. Like, I think when you're in a mobile space, you kind of realize what you're up against and you kind of, you know, change your assumptions and sort of say, well, let's, let's do what will work on this phone. And with the web, it's sort of so tempting to say, I'm going to try to, like, make it bend and submit to my will. And you kind of almost can, except that it just can't be fast enough. And then that's when you have to unlearn and realize, I'm going to sort of, you know, make it work the way it wants to work. And so, yeah, I think some people ask me again, like, oh, if you had to go back, would you have built Plaxo 3 the same way that you did with this sort of very rich Ajax interface? And I would say, well, you know, there are cases where that's absolutely what you need. And you know, think about our calendar. You're, like, paging through days, and you're zooming in and seeing you, you add appointment at 5 o'clock. Like, that's, that's a very rich interactive interface. And old school web page loading just does not cut it. You really, really want that richness. But for some stuff, for a lot of web pages, I think the model of, you know, having lots of individual little page loads that have some sort of Ajax sprinkled in for interactivity but aren't fully Ajax adapts is, is absolutely still the right way to go. And so, you know, I don't think it's the case that you should try to make everything an Ajax app. You should just basically use it where it really matters and just be, be aware that because it has cost, you should, you should use it sparingly. And then, and just remember, as you're working on this, that, like I say, everything you've been taught is wrong. It's like, th this, this is a foreign environment. This is not your desktop. This is not a compiled language. This is a special environment, and you have to learn how it wants to be, and you have to always work within that framework. You know, so try to write as little code as possible. Try, you know, a simple app that does something great is the most amazing thing, right? Um, and then try not to fight against the browser, and just be aware of when you are fighting against the browser, and then have a discussion between the product and engineering team about, is this really worth it? Is this going to make a great experience? And if it is, by all means, pull out all these tricks, but don't make your job harder than it has to be. And then just remember the mantra, which is, you know, be lazy, try to do as little work as possible, and try to kick it out. And then be responsive, try to yield early and often, and show response right away. And then just make sure that you're not the guy who let your app become slow. Thanks a lot. So we have a right, so the, the question is, how do you reconcile the tension of saying premature optimization is the root of all evil, but then also take performance seriously from day one? And I'd say the way I reconcile it is by saying, um, don't optimize in the sense of like, oh, you know, I, should, I shouldn't have this extra string operation here. Don't do that from day one. You know, build your app. But just be performance conscious from day one. Don't assume that you can't, that you'll, you'll never be able to dig yourself into a hole that you can't dig yourself out of. I mean, that's really in a nutshell what happened with Plaxo, right? So I would say, as you're thinking about it, just always have, be having this discussion about performance at a high level. So you can say, okay, l how can we make sure that we're not showing too much on the screen at one time or having to load too much stuff before we show people? And when they click on something, let's make sure we can have something we can show them right away. And that, that, that sort of idea should just be in your head as you go. And then, but then absolutely you should do like normal development knock the app out, get a prototype, play with it, and then go back and use a profiler and, and make it faster and faster and faster. But hopefully, you won't have gotten yourself into such a hard spot in the first place if you think of those general lessons as you go. Yeah, I, that's absolutely right. You're saying that th this, is, this is very much like the mentality of real-time or embedded programmers. And I, I think that's something that, you know, when I talked to some of my friends who work on some of that stuff, they were like, oh, yeah, that's totally how it is, right? But I, I just, coming from the web perspective, that's not how you're taught to think, right? And so I, that was something that you had to get in your mindset. And you're right. If, if you say, and we, we talked about this, and it, it sounded ludicrous. They were saying, like, okay, well, we'll say, you know, each module can only have 100K worth of JavaScript. And I was like, that's ridiculous. Like, you know, we're going to design features that may or may not fit in there, but, like, you know, just to set an arbitrary budget and then to have to ship a, like, you know, half-baked product. But it's, it's absolutely right. You won't win if you don't set that mentality. And, and actually, the, you know, as a general, constraints bring out creativity, right? So what, if you set those constraints up front, you'll find good ways to ship a good app with those constraints. Yeah, that's, that's a great comment. So, so the question is, what specifically makes the JavaScript slow? Um, this is actually something where I think the community would definitely benefit from some more visibility from the you know, browser vendors and the JavaScript people. I mean, I, you'd have to really answer the question, you'd have to ask, uh, you know, Brendan Eich or someone. Um, we, I can tell you what we sort of figured out from, from using it, but I'm sure actually by now, because Ajax performance has become a big deal, the browser vendors probably are thinking about other ways to release tools that would help with that, and I certainly would encourage that. But in general, I would say, so first of all, just, just parsing the JavaScript and just loading it all into memory and getting ready to execute takes a surprising amount of time when you have a large amount of JavaScript. And in particular, it seemed like the bigger it got, the slower it got at a faster than linear rate once you got over about 500K, though that probably depends a bit on the systems you're using. Um, so no, without any networking, without any DOM manipulation, it was already enough to really bring the browser to its knees. And it, we, we thought maybe it was like, you know, we're, we're using this sort of 
um, json -y kind of style where you define classes and you like attach in the functions. We thought maybe if we wrote like more vanilla style JavaScript, um, it would be easier. But we did some experiments and it didn't seem to really matter. It wasn't like we were writing hard JavaScript code. It was just the sheer quantity of it. Um, and then certainly, you know, DOM manipulation is certainly very slow. So as you start to inject stuff into the DOM, it's not just that the size of the DOM. It's if anything you're doing causes the thing to have to reflow and recalculate, especially like when you have things that are overflow hidden and so forth. It has to constantly kind of refigure out what it should show. That can be very slow. Um, and then, of course, you are you can get bottlenecked on the server. And in particular, you know, there are these things like you can only have two simultaneous connections per subdomain, and JavaScript blocks the UI thread. And there are these various tricks about you can put your images and CSS and stuff on different subdomains so that they're in parallel, and you can put your JavaScript at the bottom. But I'm, what I'm talking about is even just the core execution and loading of JavaScript is slow enough that you have to be aware of it. And people ask me, you know, is this something that is, is just a problem now, but you know, computers are getting faster, JavaScript's getting faster, and is this just going to go away? And I really think it's not. Uh, first of all, you know, we, we were talking at lunch about how like, you know, CSS is, is 10 years old already, right? And it's still not well and certainly not uniformly supported, right? So you know, you're, you're going to be using legacy applications for a long time, and you know, the web's not going anywhere. Um, but the other thing is, you know, we weren't talking about this stuff five years ago, right? We were talking about how to abuse tables for arbitrary position layout on the web pages, right? Like the, the history of the web is, is, you know, people like me that don't know better trying to figure out ways to abuse the web browsers and make them do things they were never meant to do, right? And so by the time we get this stuff figured out, we're going to be abusing web browsers in a whole new way. And so I think this mantra of realizing that you're in this, you know, sort of embedded environment and you have to learn how to make it happy is a lesson that at a meta level will carry through for a long time to come.